Hey Chemistry, Mrs. KJ here, going over 2.07, Ideal Gas Law, and we're also going to talk about the topic of absolute zero. So we have one mathematical thing today, and then we have one thing that's more conceptual. So have your calculator, pen, and paper ready. Ideal gas versus a real gas. Okay, what does the word ideal mean? It basically means perfect. And a real gas is what we actually have in real life. So a real gas is a gas as it actually behaves in all conditions of temperature and pressure. So, okay, pretty obvious, right? If it's real, it does what it does. Now, scientists sometimes have to look at ideal gases and say, well, if the gas was perfect, then it would be an idealization or the perfection of a gas as one that follows all gas laws exactly at all temperatures and pressure because there's always a few exceptions in chemistry. So when scientists work on this math problem, the ideal gas law, they're assuming that all the gases are acting the way they're supposed to. So there's a few points to it. Number one, ideal or perfect gases are made of particles that occupy negligible volume. What that means is you basically can ignore the space that the individual particles take up and just look at the space as a whole. So we would look at the whole balloon and remember there's empty spaces in between all the particles and it's just kinda like you ignore all that and you just look at the overall volume. Two and three. Two, the particles are in constant random motion so they're going crazy bouncing all over in every direction. Three, all collisions between the particles and between the particles and the container walls are perfectly elastic. Elastic means that no energy is lost as heat or light during the collision. Think about if you jump up and down on your floor. Okay, now think if you jump up and down on a trampoline. Obviously there's a big difference, right? Well, they're picturing it more as a trampoline in that when the molecule hits the edge of the balloon, it bounces back just as hard and no energy is lost. So it's like jumping up and down on a balloon, on a trampoline instead of jumping up and down on the floor. And number four, the particles do not interact with each other. So when they're ideal, we're saying they ignore each other. In real life, especially if you have a mixture of gases, sometimes the positive and negatives might interact. But again, we're just assuming it's perfect and they're all ignoring each other and having their own little trampoline party. And so, of course, the ideal gas law has a mathematical equation, and this is the law uniting all four parameters of a gas. So P. P stands for what? Pressure. And what's the unit? So I have 100, what? Kilopascals of pressure at ATP. Volume is for V, and what's the unit for volume? Liters. N. N we haven't done yet. N is the number of moles. So they could not do M for moles because there are so many M's in science. They're already used up and so they did N for the number of moles. R is a constant. So this one is always given to you. It's like this magic number that they need to use to make everything else in the equation work out. Obviously it's not magic. Obviously a lot of people spent a lot of time and energy to figure out what R is and I'll show you what R is coming up. But you don't have to worry about how they did it. You just plug in the number. And then T is what? Temperature. And what is the unit that we have to use? We have to use Kelvins. All right, with the ideal gas law, you can find the number of moles of a gas under any temperature and pressure without converting to STP. So that's why they use it. So here are the R values. So like I said, R is a constant. So R is always either 8.31 or 0 0.0821. So they're pretty close to each other numerically, other than this one is to starts at hundredths and this one starts in the ones place. So how do you know which one to use? Okay, How do you know which value of R to use? If I tell you you just plug it in to your equation, well you gotta know which one to use. Let's look at what's different. Okay, The units, they both have liters. This one has kilopascals, this one has ATMs, they both have moles, and they both have Kelvin. Oops, and I did write it a little bit different that way. 
but really if we look carefully what's the only thing that's different the only thing that's different is the unit for pressure so that's your clue the unit for pressure is your clue you use the same R as the unit for pressure so if we're using kilopascals then for R you use 8.31 if we're using ATM or atmospheres for pressure then you have to use 0 0.0821. Again, you do not have to memorize these numbers. They will always be given to you. You just need to know which one to put in your equation. All right, so let's do an equation. You have 15.0 liters of nitrogen gas at 100 degrees Celsius and 203 kilopascals. How many moles of nitrogen do you have? What do we do first? First thing is list everything you know. So I listed out all the numbers, and then after you make a list of the numbers, you need to decide what they stand for. So liters is what? Volume. Celsius is temperature. Kilopascals is pressure. Ooh, ooh. What's wrong with our temperature? It needs to be in Kelvin. How do we go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin? We add 273. So we're going to change that to 373 Kelvin is our temperature. And we're solving for N, for the number of moles. Now, which R value are we going to use for this one? Well, the only thing that's different is kilopascals or ATMs. So we have kilopascals in the equation. So we're going to use 8.31 liters kilopascals divided by moles Kelvin for, for our R value. All right. So we got PV equals NRT. How do we solve for N? Use your algebra skills. We want N by itself. So leave N on this side. How do we move the RT? Divide both sides by RT, and they cancel off here. And that gives us the formula of PV over RT equals N. Now you can plug in your numbers. So hit the pause button and do this, please. So hit the pause button, plug in your numbers, and get me an answer. So in your calculator, you should have put 203 kilopascals times 15 liters divided by 8.31 liter kilopascals divided by moles Kelvin times 373 Kelvin. We're going to pause right here for a second and look at this. This is a whole big mess of units, right? Here's what really happens. See how you have it at the bottom of a fraction and then you divide again? The rules of math say you throw it back on top. Now check this out. There's K on the top, K on the bottom, it cancels. Liters on the top, liters on the bottom, it cancels. Kilopascals on the top, kilopascals on the bottom, it cancels. So what's the only unit we have left? The only unit we have left is moles and da -da -da -da, good thing because that's what we're solving for, the number of moles. All right, and so when you put all those numbers in, your calculator, you should have gotten 0 0.98 moles. All right, let's go ahead and do one more example. Because for these, you can solve for pressure or temperature or number of moles or volume. So we'll just do one more. What pressure is exerted by a 2.0 mole sample of gas in a 10 liter container at 333 Kelvin? So list what you're given and choose the correct R. Okay, and in this one, it doesn't tell you, oh, why did they do that to me? <laughs> That's what I get for copying and pasting a question. And so we would have to know what they want the answers in, so I would have to add this in. We want our answer in kilopascals. So we'll use this same one. We made a list of everything that we know, and if it's volume, temperature, number of moles, or our R value, and we're solving for pressure. Okay, so we write down our equation, PV equals NRT. How do we solve for pressure? We want the pressure by itself, so we divide both sides by V. These Vs cancel, and we get P equals NRT over V. And now go ahead and get our answer. So hit pause, plug in all your numbers, and get me your answer, including a unit. And the answer you put in your calculator was 2 times 8.31 times 333 divided by 10. 
Notice how all the units cancel except for kilopascals. And you get 553 kilopascals for an answer. Okay, so that's it for the ideal gas law. So before we move on, again, the ideal gas law talks about the fact that we're using this mathematical equation to deal with ideal gases, which are gases that we say are perfect. So we just look at the total volume. The molecules are randomly moving. All collisions between the particles and the containers are perfectly elastic, meaning you don't lose energy. So it bounces over here, and it keeps that same energy. It's not like it bounces and it slows down. Okay, nope, it keeps the energy, so it's always moving like crazy, bouncing all over. And the particles do not interact with each other. Now, that does mean that they can bump into each other, but they don't chemically interact with each other. Okay, um, I just changed my mind. I think I'm just going to change this unit to just be the ideal gas law, and we'll hit absolute zero in the next lesson because there are some concepts you do need to know along with the math. So go ahead and you can just focus on this, do the pre-quiz. If you have questions, let me know, and then go ahead and take the quiz. And again, as always, if you have questions, let me know. All right, have a great day, everybody.